ladies and gents, to uh, the Wellbeing Festival, to day two, I believe we're on. And I'm just going to go through a couple of slides and get um, this show going so we can hand over. So welcome to the session on reducing shame and stigma. Stigma, sorry. And I am, hello, my name is David Harrison. I'm one of the organisational development facilitators from L&D. And I'm supported in the background by my colleagues, Robert and Louise, who will be managing things like chat boxes and the recording of the session and anything else that could go right or wrong throughout the day. You will notice that your cameras have been uh, disabled and your mics at the moment. They will be reactivated uh, when you go into breakout rooms where recording will stop at that point for any discussions. And when we come back, the recording will start again, except for when it comes to a point when the ladies on the screen want to have an open discussion and to make that a safe environment, we will cease recording at that point. But you will get a notification when that happens. You can use the chat box on the top uh, of your little bars there. It looks like a little uh, message. So if you do have any questions as we go through, please use that. And that way we can answer or look at questions on your behalf. If you do have a hearing impairment, you do have the capability of turning on the live captions function on your PC, but you would have to do that yourselves. It can't be done remotely from this end. If you do have a question throughout the session, there is a chance to raise your hand function, which is like a little emoji with a hand on. Please use that if you want to ask questions as well. And when it comes to the discussion part, once again, the recording will be stopped, but please use your raise hand function at that point. And towards the end, there might be an opportunity where cameras and mics are off to create the environment where we can have an open discussion. The recording, like I said, will be, uh, the session will be recorded, but there will be times when it is stopped so we can have those safe conversations and discussions. And the last thing I'll mention is we are going to go and use breakout rooms today. Please don't worry about hitting buttons or anything like that. My colleague in the background, Louise, will magically transform you off there and bring you back at the end. And there'll be questions for you to discuss throughout this session. So that is enough about the sort of admin, if you like. I'm now going to hand you over to Natalie and Arabella, who will do more of an introduction about themselves and the sessions. So I'm stop sharing the screen at this point, ladies, and I will hand over to you. OK, so um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session on reducing shame and stigma in relation to uh, mental health difficulties. Um, my name's Arabella Kurtz. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and uh, was very happy to join NHFT in January to lead setup of a system wide staff health and wellbeing service. Um, and uh, I should say that this has been funded by um, NHS England and NHS charities together in response to the immense pressures of the pandemic that we've all been facing. Um, now, those of us who work in mental health services know all too well about the terrible stigma and shame that can be associated with acknowledgement of problems. What I think Natalie will be particularly addressing today is the particular difficulty for health and social care staff um, in acknowledging problems uh, because we are used, we are strong, capable and resourceful people. That's why we do the work we do. Uh, we're used to seeing ourselves in this way and we're used to others seeing us in this way. And I would just like to share with you before Natalie starts, my conviction born of many years experience that it's possible to be both strong resourceful have an immense amount to give others but also able to connect with uh, acknowledge uh, vulnerability and difficulties in ourselves uh, it's all part of being human and um, i know natalie will be talking about this with you 
So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, a colleague who I regard as very brave and inspiring in the work she's been doing in recent years. Natalie is a clinical psychologist and in 2017 she set up an organisation devoted to valuing, destigmatizing, and supporting the lived experience of mental health difficulties in those of us who work in health and social care. Over to you Natalie. Thank you so much Arabella and thank you David um, this morning for setting the scene so nicely about um, how, how this works today. Um, I am really happy to be here as a part of your wellbeing festival um, and to talk more about um, what I call provider mental health stigma so those of us in the regulated mental health professions and wider um, who um, have lived experience of struggling with our own mental health difficulties um, and um, how I came to that um, in setting up Integrate Mental Health and some of the work we do and some of the ways we uh, very gently, I think uh, gentleness is so important, come around compassionately to understanding that we can move fluidly in and out of um, these positions of being somebody who seeks help and also provides help um, through our lifetime as humans living lives as we all do, as we all did before we trained, you know. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about that today. I've got some slides to go through and then I hope we'll um, do a breakout room and come back. And um, as was said before, we're, we're recording this part, uh, but then we'll stop recording for the breakout rooms and the discussion at the end. Um, and if anybody wants to bring their lived experience of mental health difficulties, uh, that experiential knowledge will be truly valued. Um, I'm going to be speaking a bit about my own, but there is, of course, absolutely no pressure to do so whatsoever. It was a very personal, personal decisions. OK, so I'm going to um, share some slides. Let's hope I make this work and I'm going to include sounds because I'm hoping to also share um, a trailer if I have time. So let's just see. OK, hopefully you can see that. OK, Arabella, do you know if that's showing all right? OK. So as um, introduced, my name's Natalie Kemp and oh, can you can you hear me all right? Yes, Natalie, all is good. OK, sorry, because I, I can't see, so I'm just uh, reliant on audio feedback. OK, so my name is Natalie Kemp and I'm a clinical psychologist um, and I have lived experience of mental health difficulties myself. Um, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Integrate Mental Health and I'm also a clinical tutor um, on the Hertfordshire course, uh, um, helping to provide training to uh, the clinical psychologists upcoming, you know. Um, and um, I wanted to start a little bit by saying that we're going to go through a bit of story sharing from myself. We're going to have a little look at provider mental health stigma. We're going to have a look at broadening out from what I call an NHS wellbeing narrative. So that's very important, uh, but also broadening out from that. Have a little look at us and them as can happen, this kind of split um, in the scene. And then we're going to have time for a breakout group. Um, hopefully I'll have time to show you the trailer, but if I don't have time today, um, I can point to where you can find it. And that's um, uh, in conversation with, I was in conversation with various um, mental health professionals internationally who had lived experience of mental health difficulties. And that's on our YouTube site there. Um, that was the lockdown one <laughs> project <laughs> to do something. <laughs> so that's what I got on with. Um, okay, so... Uh, just before I begin to think about, um, share a little bit about my story, what I'm asking us to think about here is looking through the lens of stigma specifically. So we know that unchecked stigmatised attitudes are damaging to people. They can other our own colleagues. They can make us believe that those uh, with many different types of experience of distress, um, some more stigmatised than others, are not sitting next to us at work but are indeed only to be found in the needing help position in our services. Well, of course, that's not true. Um, and I you know, sit next to people all the time who have their own experience of mental health difficulties, or if you're talking diagnostic languages, a range of diagnoses or a range of narratives um, around their distress, um, including people who would 
by their by what they talk about would uh, be deemed to be too complex for the very services that they run <laughs> okay so we're looking at how um, our lived experience of mental health difficulties is really threaded all the way through our workforce um, and to be aware that in addition to coping with any kind of mental pain that somebody might be going through for whatever reason is happening inside work, outside of work, um, happened through their childhood, um, all of us have lived lives. Um, some, when people go into crisis or into distress around that, um, people are often also dealing with an additional layer, which is this layer of stigma that can be around, which uh, we have to cope with. And that can be lots of erroneous beliefs or stereotypes or prejudices, uh, common misconceptions about people who struggle with their mental health, that people are dangerous, behave on predictability or incompetent, which is really important to hold in mind when we're talking about being a provider also of mental health services or services wider in health. I speak about mental health um, specifically a lot because that's what Integrate um, is born around. It's about supporting mental health professionals um, who have lived experience. Uh, but, but obviously the themes are wider. Um, also a sense that we can't look after ourselves or we're not to be trusted. So just want to hold those thoughts in mind um, and looking through this lens. Um, in terms of uh, a little bit about me and where I'm coming from, and always quite mindful when sharing because I, I assume that we have lots of lived experience in the room. And um, so just keep just to general theories um, that I broke down in 2015 um, as a clinical psychologist, I was, uh, and as many other multiple identities that I have as, as a sister or a cousin or, uh, you know, a person walking through life, a daughter. Um, but I was also a clinical psychologist um, in a team. And um, I broke down in that service because of uh, something that was going on in my own life. And also that service was going through really many, many changes, um, which... Uh, I have to say, weren't being handled so well. There wasn't a place for uh, people to talk about and express um, how difficult it was. And we know things change in services all the time, so that's more uh, the, the standard <laughs> rather than things are often the same. But when I was going through my own difficulties, to have that, um, to have those difficulties also going on in services to, to, the, to the extent that we didn't even have rooms at one point to see people. It's where things had got very difficult. Um, it was it was quite destabilizing. And um, when I when I broke down, I actually my supervisor was fantastic and my manager was also fantastic. Um, and I was able to speak and say and also I come from a place where I feel like I should be able to. So I'm quite strong in terms of my self advocacy in in the sense that I would be um, advocate strongly for anybody um, who I was working with. Um, so I, I don't see a difference there. And so I, I, I believe that it's important. And of course, people should listen to what I have to say when I need to say it, if I need to ask for that. So um, I have that very strongly. I've had many years of psychoanalysis myself, uh, which I've engaged with to understand myself in order to understand the people uh, and the work that I do. Because when you're a mind working with minds, I think to know yourself um, is as important as, as collaboratively working with other people to help them navigate their path too. Um, and of course they hold um, the knowledge on how to do that and I hope to be able to do something alongside them to the best that I can. Um, but to be in touch with my humanness um, is very important in order to be in touch with the humanness everywhere uh, that is around us. Um, when the breakdown happened, it was important that it happened. It made sense in the context of um, the psychological work that I was doing on myself. And it, it made really good sense to pull back, take time and rest and heal, um, and then to think about how to come back. But what really struck me was uh, the stigma that I experienced that was an additional layer of pain um, about how um, I was a provider of mental health services and uh, perhaps shouldn't be breaking down. And I'm going to go on and talk a bit more about that. I'm going to broaden out from a well-being narrative. So um, the daily mental hygiene that we do is really important. Um, and the fact that it's in there in our well-being policies is important, although interesting 
Um, but in health, uh, we should have to think about this, you know, when we do this and we talk about this to other people. And I'm talking about this, this whole big systems around us here, uh, that it's interesting that we've had to really attend to this and that perhaps COVID has um, highlighted this, whereas actually it should just be our normal human experience at work, the mental hygiene is a part and parcel of what um, systems have a responsibility to look at, and we do too. Um, but I want to draw out from a tendency to reduce staff experiences to only factors of workforce burnout here, which is an organisational syndrome and not a mental health difficulty, although it can lead to significant upset in, in, in the individual. Um, and to only focus on daily mental hygiene, to broad out, to fully contextualise the humanity of our workforce here and to normalise the moving in and out of mental health difficulties that any one of us can have that anyone can struggle in the face of life's challenges at any time due to factors inside and outside of work. I want to broaden out from the fact that mental health difficulties uh, may only be occurring due to, due to this nightmare that is COVID. That is absolutely the case, but also those who provide help have always also struggled with their mental health at different points as, as a human population in this workforce struggling now and they will struggle in the future and it would take writing many social inequalities uh, to change this so I really want to broaden out to get a really a sense of a full systems um, social understanding of why mental health difficulties happen um, and COVID is not the only reason COVID will pass at some point this 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 nightmare will become something different um, we, we'll all still be working with it in, in health, and, and I understand that that's, that's really important, but it will always, um, it's, it's not the only reason why uh, we should be focusing on uh, you know, um, broadening out and accepting uh, that people struggle with their mental health who are also in the self workforce. I want to encourage us to have a bigger picture. Um, I also want to broaden out from what I've noticed from the work that I do at Integrate it can be very rigid ideas of um, please go away, fix yourself, return, and let's kind of not really talk any more about your experiences. I want to reflect on how the workplace um, is one part of a healing journey for those people, uh, many of us who have experienced mental health uh, difficulties and to honour the recovery time that's needed when we re-engage back in with work. Um, that having lived experiences of mental health difficulties in our staff systems um, should be integrated into improving that same systems as well. So bringing back, and that's the value of that lived experience, that experiential knowledge, we bring back our experience of occupational health, um, of uh, management styles, of what it's like to be out of a team and then back into a team, cultures and attitudes around how we're met. Um, all of these things are really important and the very people who often feel sometimes the most isolated or often um, as some mental health professionals or lived experience have said kind of almost morally injured in a sense because we're working in mental health so we expect people to understand mental health and yet sometimes we can feel quite cast out and stigmatised for having experienced it. So how are people uh, treating us when we're feeling on the outside and how are people bringing us back in? Um, and I also want to broaden out from an individual employee focus to challenging what we experience as more structural stigma. So understanding uh, that it's not just um, uh, the patients or the service users or the clients, whatever language that you use, who have or hold this vulnerability, that actually we all do. And sometimes that shows up in distress of different types. So um, whilst I'm uh, acknowledging uh, the, the desperate importance and the nightmare uh, that COVID has brought us to um, deal with, I'm asking us also to look um, longitudinally uh, throughout history and into the future at how we're going to continue to meet uh, people where they're at 
um, in terms of the difficulties, uh, the, the, the mental health difficulties that we might bring, to not uh, split that off or cast that aside, but to integrate it into our understanding for a stronger, more robust way of working as a workforce. Just a note on internalised stigma. Um, I mean, these these um, slides are going to be available, so we've only got a certain amount of time. But internalised stigma is some is um, happens when a person absorbs message, stigmatising messages about mental health difficulties inside and, and agrees with them. That sounds like quite a conscious process. Um, it's kind of not really. It's something that's quite insidious and that can get in. We grow up around this um, ever since. Uh, the stigma of you know what we used to think about in society about people in asylums um mental health stigma the service user movement all of which is raising awareness of how not to other uh, people and how not to other the vulnerability that we all carry um this these stereotypes and stigmas can get in uh, to the self and can be become quite deleterious um, in terms of how people can cope um, also with their mental health difficulties. It can decrease hope and self-esteem. It can worsen symptoms if you use symptom language. Um, and it can decrease uh, people um, feeling able to um, ask for help or make approach behaviours. Um, we see internalised stigma not as an individual problem in the person. We see it as a social responsibility because those are where the messages are coming from so it's an individual manifestation of a very deleterious social phenomenon so the answer is to look at the systems and the cultures and society around us to address that let's hold intersectionality in mind um, so uh, we mentor people have not only been stigmatised from having lived experience of mental health difficulties, but also have experienced other dimensions of oppression through class or their race. Um, and I want to mention Kimberly Crenshaw here. Um, the theory of intersectionality has its roots in the work of her as a black feminist scholar activist. And it presents an opportunity for us to draw attention to structural social levels of social injustice and interlocking systems of oppression um, and stigma and the impact of those on inequality and um, health and well-being. So at Integrate, uh, we take a whole systems approach from very much grassroots activism to influence structural stigma change. And there are three main approaches to reducing stigma towards people with mental health difficulties. If you're going to look into the journals, that kind of knowledge. Um, there's consumer contact. This is an American uh, word, so it means those who are using services. So contact to increase contact with people who have lived experience of mental health difficulties to change views uh, and impressions of that. Um, education around mental health um, and protest or social activism and we are at Integrate, we're, we're quite, uh, we would uh, identify ourselves as being activists for change in this area. Um, this is a quick note to thinking systemically for any of you who are interested in Bromf and Brenner's ecological model. It just tells us how the individual is in the relationship with the system around us from our close family, friends, health service, church, synagogue, um, through to uh, larger systems of uh, social services, industry, mass media, our neighbours, through to government. And all of these have an impact on us and we can have an impact on them. So it's again another reason why we can look through and understand stigma as a relational or social phenomenon that we all need to attend to. It, this is why we work systemically at Integrate Mental Health, so I'm involved. Uh, in working directly with professional bodies um, involved in writing stuff, um, uh, guidance, um, involved with our regulators, important because there's no air between, at the moment, an over conflation between fitness to practice issues and having lived experience of mental health difficulties, as if uh, you can't have lived experience of mental health difficulties and be a competent practitioner, that's nonsense. So we're trying to pull those apart and to work with, for example, HCPC about that. 
working with training institutions, we do a lot of training, um, predominantly um, in the clinical psychology trainings at the moment, because I guess that's where uh, we were born through into our professional careers, but we also do um, psychology and counselling undergraduate trainings, really for any provider trainings to take, take notice of this. Um, we link in with NHS Trusts. Um, we do a lot of peer work, so we offer individual peer work with uh, mental health um, professionals, regulated mental health professionals with lived experience and mental health difficulties to do individual work. And we're just running our first group peer space, which is so powerful. I can't tell you. It's the most amazing, most incredible space. And some people with the most stigmatised why, <laughs> you know, of uh, diagnoses, if you like, talking and sharing and connecting and finding release and relief and a sense of, of course, you can do your work. <laughs> um, and with public, you know, do a lot of consultation. Uh, this is some of the work, for example, just thinking again about how, how do we look at this stigma while well, some of it is in the written word, right? You've got to get into guidance. So supporting valuing lived experience in clinical psychology training, uh, lobbying, um, as you know, as I did for uh, British Psychological Society to put out a statement saying it's OK to have lived experience as a mental health professional. <laughs> you know, you need those top line statements as well as this grassroots work um, and other things about what caring work cultures look like. A note on us and them. Um, so us and them is this idea that there's a static divide um, in services which is predicated on and then being two different types of human beings or populations, which is, of course, nonsense. I hope you're picking that up in my voice. <laughs> the forever well and the forever unwell. Those who, um, those who never experience any vulnerabilities, work 24 hours a day, almost as if over identified with the very services that we set to put out. Now, those services may have to work, you know, 24 hours a day. But the humans, the fleshy, flesh and blood humans in them um, couldn't, couldn't possibly. And, and, and also couldn't ever possibly um, live a life without kind of distress or stress or, you know, wherever. So so there needs to be a slight separation between what the service wants to provide and then how it works uh, compassionately with the humans in it providing that service. And then there's so, but there's a sense of, you know, um, almost idealised people, you know, which is kind of a nonsense that pe you know people who are never touched by any vulnerability who are providers and then them who are always the offset of that unfortunately is the, the weak and the broken all these terrible words um you know and, and and what that does if we buy into that split of the us and the m for us say us as mental health providers or health providers it, it really invalidates and silences and shames the lived experience that we have um, it says that to break down is to be weak and shameful, uncontaining, incompetent. It creates fitness to practice fear, maintains a strange idealization of healthcare professionals as kind of non-human. That we all must be perfectly processed, always on and available. That's not true. We can't say we're breaking down. We suffer more pain than is necessary. And if we do break down, we've done something wrong and we've transgressed to a them that doesn't exist either, you know. Um, it undermines also the value of our experiential knowledge in teaching and in workplaces and also in our mindfulness around triggering as well. And, and for them, this, this other group that doesn't actually exist, um, for those who, who are using services, that's terrible, right? So what that does, it maintains an invalidating denigration of service users is forever weak, broken, no hope of recovery, and certainly undermines any transitions they might want to make into moving into a career as a healthcare professional, this idealized other thing over there, which doesn't, none of this exists, it bears no resemblance to reality at all. But what this split does is it, it really is perpetuating this idea that vulnerability is outside the room, there's no vulnerability inside the room, and it causes a lot of pain for everybody. Um, and it also, I would posit, undermines organisational um, attempts to really co-produce, actually, because if we can't be alongside and accepting and integrating of our own mental health difficulties in our professions, what are we saying? It's a big tell, right? So how do other people watching that pick that up? Well, they're clearly stigmatising, you know? 
they're clearly not valuing lived experience they can't even do it on the inside so we really must you know it's a bit bit of turning the mirror inwards which is which is painful to do but could be compassionately done as a learning experience together um so i've just noticed we're getting to halfway and i want to have as much time um so just a quick note um on what what happens when you do move from us to them as as many of my my peers have experienced um you can feel real rejection or abandonment by the profession you can feel like suddenly there's like uh, uncertainty about confidentiality and who knows what perhaps if, if you're a psychologist it's you that people usually used, used to come to <laughs> to consult about this but actually you're the one who's broken down right now whatever words you want to use uh people don't know what to do with that um and you kind of feel like you need to hold yourself together or explain things when as we know when you're struggling with your mental health or you're in crisis sometimes you just don't know what's going on yet that's that's why therapy is there to help if you use therapy you know it's it's a it's a process in the journey so how do you how do you be in this very vulnerable place as a provider of help and it, that's then about um compassionate communities coming around you and supporting you whilst you don't know um there's lots of reasons why people share for contact um in their own peer support for in clinical supervisions we have in psychology um for local stigma anti-stigma activism and public anti-stigma activism of the sort that we do and also there's guidance you know coming about at sharing in the therapeutic relationship this is when you're not a peer support worker who's overtly um, employed and there and it, you know will choose what to share um in the therapeutic relationship uh, this is if you're a regulated mental health professional where that's not a part of your job uh, but you want to think about how much do i share with 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 the clients that i see so acknowledging these things um it's a sense of humanity threaded through the workforce a common humanity nobody is any different to any other on this uh, can help community happen um so let's move to a think space um and i want to ask you to consider uh, these questions that i'm going to put up um uh, and I want you to uh, nominate a person to feedback some main themes when we come back. Um, you don't need to share any lived experience of mental health difficulties, just to reiterate that, unless you choose to. We work from an, a position of privacy and emotional safety. Um, and when thinking about mental health difficulties, people may think in terms of medical diagnoses or psychological formulations or narratives of distress. However, whatever language you use, um, that's all welcome. And these are some of the questions I'd like you to consider. Um, thank, you. thank you so much, Natalie. And I, I hope that this is part of an ongoing organisation within our system. And we do know where you are. And it's great <laughs> to have you as an ally alongside us. Absolutely. And thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a real joy to be here with everyone. And I, I much prefer to be in the actual room with faces so I can see you. Uh, but, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be able to get back to that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Excellent, absolutely excellent session, uh, Natalie and Arabella. Thank you very much for that. Recording has started again just for the, the final few minutes here before we um, before we close this session. But just before we do, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I thought I was, but I clicked the wrong thing and it didn't come up. There we go. Hopefully now I'm sharing those final slides that we'll just talk through in a second. But before I do, um, Massive round of applause. OK, it was really good to have that environment, I think. And so I heard someone use that word valued and um, that value. And I think this has massive value. And hopefully it's a first step for a lot of professionals or people on that journey or even people like myself and my colleagues in L&D and OD who talk about all our values in particular are sort of thought of ones that fit our NHFT and can we start changing that culture so it does become I did hear one lady say and yourself it's okay not to be okay but it's not okay for an organization to do nothing about it and I think this journey we're on is trying to merge that so we do have the right environments but that's enough thank you very much um, ladies please feedback is massively important it helps us do things even better 
and also it helps us shape what's going on. Um, in a moment, there'll be a few links in the chat box. Louise will be putting them in there. Please go and click on them. If you are down with the kids and you have a QR scanner, OK, <laughs> scan away and it will send you to the right place. But there is a chance of winning a goodie bag. We are not like the BBC or other channels where we will cost you two pounds and we will bombard you for the rest of your life with messages and texts. We will leave it up to you. But you've got to be in it to win it. And there's a nice goodie bag to win. But please, that feedback does help us. Um, just moving on, my my clicking skills are not great here, are they? I'm multitasking and it's not working. There we go. Oh, no, it's still not working. And yes, there we go. So there is more and more and more. Please screenshot that calendar right now. Join in the other stuff. If you can't do that, share it, shout about it. The one way of us getting better at what we do and sharing our experiences and growing and developing and everything else is go and join these meetings. There is over four and a half thousand people in this organization. Let's get it out to every single person, no matter what job they do, because people are your biggest assets. And get involved, okay? So it's time to get involved, do some step challenges. And this, once again, uh, physio are asking everyone to get up and do a bit of movement. When I have a break, I'm going out in the garden and doing a bit of deadheading, so that's my excuse. Also, take some pictures. There are different frame themes. Easy to see it. Say when you're not breaking these teeth in for a donkey. Get out, take some pictures and share them on the Twitters and the socials. Once again, when people are nosy, they want to know what it is. And um, I've got a few pictures ready. And also share your music. Um, at the end of all this, they want to put a bit of a compilation together. There's a big word that I can't spell of all the good music that everyone from the trust enjoys. And we'll make a nice little video and a sing song. Loads of resources. Go on to the website. They're all free. Like I said, we don't charge. So go on there, get them downloaded and use them. And once again, there's all the hashtags. If you're on any of those things there, Twitter's, Instagram, I think the middle one is, the or Insta, if you're down with the kids, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever you use, get on there, start shouting about it, start talking about it because it is important and also it creates the right environment. And once again, we want people to have a lot of fun with this, but also just on reflection, when we have conversations like this, it can bring back thoughts, memories, or even reflecting where you are currently. And it is okay not uh, to be, it is okay not to be okay, but let's do something about it. And on there, we've got the Stronger Together. So please let's use that and contact people if you do need that support right now, okay? And we have the other, we have our mental health number and we have um, our day-to-day -day struggles getting you down. We have that number there, 0300 999 16 16. But also never forget about the power of your peers, your colleagues, your friends, and your family. So it is, and it can bring back stuff from having conversations like this. So please use them. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now well he's trying but there we go stop sharing my screen thank you very much to natalie and arabella for doing that thank you very much to those ladies and gents who came in and gave us those conversations and those thoughts i hope to see you on the next sessions but thank you very much for joining in it's been an absolute excellent session lots of conversation in the chat box uh particularly for natalie and arabella to go back and look at again but see you again soon and there's the obligatory wave because apparently we do that on Teams. Thank you very much. <laughs>